This video is going to go through some uh, definitions and basic terminology associated with experiments. Uh, unfortunately, I deleted this page from the lecture notes, so I'll post a PDF if you want it on Blackboard. So you can go to Blackboard and grab that. Um, otherwise, you can just watch it, and this should be more than enough. So the basic terminology of experiments does tend to be something I put on tests, not like a ton. I'll show you exactly which parts. Um, um, but usually, they're very similar things you're going to see in your homework. First definition we have here is what our experimental units are. Experimental units are the actual items or subjects that are being given the treatment. Um, these can be different than our observational units. If you remember observational units from the homework, uh, this is who we collect data from. And this differs from our experimental units because this is who we assign treatments. So I'm going to give you a, a made-up example of how these two groups could be different, how these two different things could be different. So our, uh, the way this could work, let's use a CT as, as an example. So for CTs, right now it's done as an observational study. They just give a CT to any teacher that's willing and has a class that works at a good time for CTs. Um, but ideally, if they really wanted to be able to talk about some sort of causal relationship like this, X causes Y, um, they would want to set up an experiment. Because in an observational study, you have a lot of issues with selection bias, whether it's talking about the teachers who are willing to take CTs are different than the teachers who don't take in CTs, or the students who go to a CT session are different than the students who don't go to CT sessions, right? You always have that trouble with an observational study. So experiments are the bee's knees. We like to use them if we can. So how we could do this with a CT session? What they would do is they would take all the classes, right? All the sections, say, of 119. So we'll just put this as 119 classes. All right, we'll pretend this is stats. So we have this big old list of every 119 class. If life were good and we could do an experiment, what we would do is we would randomly assign, right? And we would randomly assign those classes to either have a CT or have no CT. That would be our options. So once we have that, we go, okay, cool. This is definitely going to be, right? Our experimental units. This was the thing that was randomly assigned. Now, ideally, what they would do is they would only look at this. I mean, if this was a perfect experiment, they would only look at the class level data. So they would only look at say, okay, here's the class. Um, how? What was the pass rate for this for these classes that had a CT versus the pass rate for the classes that didn't have a CT? So it's literally just looking at the class level. Whether or not a student goes to CT sessions is irrelevant. It's about the CT being present in the room. Does that make a difference, that ability to go to the CT sessions at all? Now, what they tend to do more at this school is they look a lot more at the student level. So if we come at the end, and instead of looking at the classes, we look at the students, then our observational study, right, our observational units, the things we're collecting data from, are different than our experimental units. So this is a possibility that our assignment is just easier to do at the class level and then the data we want to collect is at the student level. So that's one time that our observational units and our experiments would be different. Uh, our experimental units and observational units would be different. So next definition we have, uh, there's a reason I put the x to y here, is actually six definitions in, y, in one. We have three different ways that we can talk about this variable that we think influences our outcome, right? So we have explanatory, which I always like because it has an X in it. That's how I keep it straight. Um, independent, right? The other one depends on it. So this is the one that moves independently. Um, or the very experimental design way to talk about it, our factor. So our factor influences our response. So you got three other ways to talk about response, outcome, independent. Levels. For a particular factor, a particular thing we think might influence our out, uh, outcome, it could have specific values available. So if we think back to that worksheet we did on Thursday, department looked like this. I don't know exactly know what it looked like, but it was something like this. Uh, 130, 130, up to 130. 
we actually had three levels of that department. And that distracted a lot of people when they were looking for the number of variables as they dumped into this one variable and said, oh, there are three levels to that variable. So that's what levels are. Within a particular factor, within a particular variable, how many possible outcomes were there? So that's our levels as an example. You can keep that example there if you want. I just wanted to get rid of it. Um, our treatment. Our treatment, if we only have one thing that we're dealing with here, uh, so for our example, it would have been CT or no CT. Those are the two treatments that are available. Um, but I'm going to make this a little bit more exciting. Uh, we also had um, some other options last semester that were going on at a class level uh, looking at student success. And one of the programs was having an embedded counselor. So having a counselor who came in, did a little brief intro at the beginning class, took students out during class uh, to give them counseling sessions, and then let, like had a little post session. So let's pretend that we have two options for CT, CT or no CT. And let's pretend embedded counseling had uh, a true embedded counseling. Let's say that there was some embedded counseling light just to make life easy. Um, there was some version where you could have less happen. Uh, you could just have them one day or something and then uh, no embedded counseling. So two levels of the CT, three levels for embedded counseling. How many possible treatments are there? Well, this is why I wanted to do this is because the treatment is about the combination of these things. So one class might have a CT and embedded counselor, right? They have both. Well, the next might have CT and the light version of the embedded counselor. And the third might have the CT, but no embedded counselor. And then we have options on the other side. We could have had no CT with an embedded counselor, no CT with an embedded counselor light, and no CT with no embedded counseling, right? So turns out we have two times three, six possible treatments if this is our experiment that we would need to be able to assign our classes to up here instead of the CT, no CT. So. You can kind of think of this as we could do the random assignment to the CTs and then do more random assignment here um, to the three different groups. So that's why it's going to be two times three to get our six possible treatments. Okay, so our control group. These are the people who are not given a treatment. So in this case, this would have been these people. Would have been our no CT session over there. Um, this is necessary because we need to show that this is working better than nothing, right? Um, especially if you think about the CTs, if we just gave every class a CT and we saw improvement, um, it may be that the CTs are helping, but it may also be that there's something different, maybe from fall to spring, uh, the people who enroll in a class in the spring uh, may be a different group of students than the people who enroll in the fall. More of the falls are probably placed in where Mars spring is probably coming out of a class or something. So there could be a very big difference semester to semester. Um, the other reason is because we know that you should have a placebo in a sort of a medical trial, and this is necessary because there is such a thing as a placebo effect, right? If you tell somebody they're getting a drug and it's going to help them, um, they will physiologically actually improve. So you need to have uh, a control so that way you can figure out the difference between the amount they improved and the amount of people with the real drug improved so you can control for that placebo effect. Um, and then our last definition here along with that placebo uh, whenever you're using a placebo, whenever you're keeping people from knowing whether they're in a treatment or a control group, we call we call that blinding. Um, single blinding is when the patient is unaware or the experimental unit is unaware, and double blinding is when both the experimental unit and the person recording things are unaware. So some definitions. Uh, the big ones in terms of testing, uh, being able to identify factors or independent variables or explanatory variables in our response, and that's what we do in the homework. Uh, identifying our different treatments or how many treatments there might be another one. So those are the two big ones of those definitions. So we're going to do an example. Um, I'm going to give you guys a second. I want you to read through this. Take your shot at identifying each of the pieces we talked about. Um, so pause the video and do that. All right, so if you came back, I put these in an order that makes me happy. Um, the response variable is always to me the most important. Like, what is it that we're measuring at the end, right? What is our, 
that is terrible looking at it and there's not enough space. Um, what is our outcome, right? That's what a response is, our outcome. So we look, we say at the end of this, the level of cleaning for each shirt is recorded on a scale of one to 10. So that's our response variable, level of cleaning, which is really interesting English, but I'm just gonna go with it. And that's from one to 10. All right, our explanatory variable here, what are the things that we think might influence the cleanliness level of the shirt or the level of cleaning? Um, and it looks like we are assigning with water temps and wash cycles. All right, so remember these are our explanatory variables. We think they're going to influence that, our level of cleaning. So number of treatments. Now, if we look at our water temp and wash cycles, water temp, there were three, cold, warm, and hot. And wash cycles, there were two, regular or delicate. So this is exactly like the uh, example I gave you with the uh, CT and the embedded counseling. Uh, we have six different treatments. If you wanted to write down what those treatments are, it'd be cold, regular, cold, delicate, uh, warm, regular, warm, delicate, and hot, regular, hot, delicate. All right, those are your six different treatments. Our experimental units, the things we are randomly assigning, it looks like each shirt is being assigned, right? Um, there's nothing here showing that this is a load of laundry or anything, it just says uh, the t-shirts themselves. Um, the average level of cleaning that ends up being recorded, well, this is a sample of 60 white shirts, so this is a statistic, right? It's not the true value. Um, and the last piece here, why is blinding used? Um, and this is to reduce our bias. Um, it makes sense. I mean, if I, my personal belief is the hotter water is, the, the better job it does cleaning. So um, I would probably assume this does a better job cleaning. And I don't know how, how impartial I could be if I knew what the shirts had come out of the laundry from. So it's to reduce our, our bias there. All right, so this isn't uh, this is a question that's in your homework. I did not go and open your homework assignment, but I promise you this is a homework assignment, so you can go to your homework and record it there. So I'm going to go ahead and identify each of the following things again for this shrimp example from the homework. So first thing we need to do is determine what type of study this is. Is it a observational or experiment? So we're studying the conditions, and again, you can pause and try this on your own if you want. Um, we're studying the conditions under which shrimp will remain maximum weight. Uh, two temperatures are selected for the study. Uh, they are raised containers with a specified temperature and salinity. Weight gain is then recorded. Um, they're not really talking too much about the random assignment, but this is definitely going to be an experiment, uh, and it appears to just be completely randomized. If this were a block experiment, what they would have done is they would have taken the shrimp and then divided the shrimp up by, like, the, the different type, like pounds of shrimp, you know, I think there's like five pound shrimp or what. I don't, I have no idea. I don't, I don't understand shrimp. I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat these things, but they will maybe divide them by the types of shrimp. Tiger shrimp is a thing, right? Other, whatever the other type of shrimp is. And then once they had them in these groups, then they would assign to the different things. Um, this would be a block design to take all the shrimp and divide them up first. Uh, since we don't have anything going on with this weird division or grouping, we're just doing a completely randomized experiment. Um, our uh, experimental units or subjects, but we don't call shrimp subjects. Um, it appears that to be these shrimp, they're raised in containers. And the containers are the things with the specific water temps or salinity levels. So technically, our experimental units are these containers of shrimp. The shrimp are what we end up measuring at the end. Um, they're going to be our observational units, technically. Um, and then we record the weight gain. Okay, so what else do we need? We need our explanatory response. I like to start with my response. What are we measuring at the end? Weight gain. And what did we think might influence that? What were we manipulating? What are our factors? Well, that is the water temp and our salinity levels. And then the last thing we have to deal with here, um, we need to figure out our treatments themselves, which is that still we're going to have to do that combinations business, and then the number of them. So our treatments, our water temps, 25 degrees with 10%, 25 degrees with 20%, 20, oh, if 
five degrees with 30%. You guys get the idea. And then we do the same thing for the 35 degrees. Uh, we're going to end up with a total number of treatments of eight. So that's putting it into practice. That's that one homework of the three that you're going to have to do.